Hello, and welcome to the NISFA Open Doors Film Panel Series. I'm Professor Jeffrey Wasatsky, and we're coming to you live from the studios of Bronx Community College. This is our final show for the semester, and we hope that you'll enjoy it, because it's a great time right now to be a film student in New York State, thanks to Governor Cuomo's highly successful production tax credit program. New York's film industry is growing and thriving. And that means new production-related jobs are being created every day. Today on the program, we'll be talking to a distinguished panel of production designers. We'll take an inside look at how production designers create the overall visual look of the production. Besides me is Christy Zia, production designer, costume designer, and producer, and Javier Amajeras, a concept illustrator, art director, and production designer. Welcome to the program. We have a lot to talk about, so let's get started. <laughs> Our film students in the audience and the students watching this program online, they want to know the story of how each of you began your career, how did you get started in the industry, and what made you choose to become production designers. Christy? Gosh, uh, I started actually as a stylist for a commercial photographer. Stylists get props, locations, wardrobe, pro everything for commercials. And once I started there, I moved on from there to television. Uh, did many years doing um, sort of afternoon children's specials and small projects like that. Then from that, I moved to film. And at that point, I started working as a costume designer. And the first film I did as a costume designer was Fame, back in 1979. I saw it. You saw Me it. Me too. Um, and so Fame was my sort of, that, that's where I break, began. And I did many costume films for several years. And then I moved on from that to doing sets and uh, art direction. Um, and then I went from that into production design. So that was the segue from stylist to production designer. Javier? Uh, I went to school at the Maryland Institute College of Art down in Baltimore. I was a very involved student and then one day someone who worked at the administration office gave me a piece of paper with a friend of hers from the Maryland Film Commission saying there was a production designer seeking an illustrator. I studied more traditional illustration, editorial book illustration, and this person at the Film Commission put me together with a production designer named Shepard Frankel and um, he hired me on my first film, which was Step Up. And that kind of catapulted the beginning of my career. Once I started doing film, I never looked back, and I've been doing it since. That's great. So this is a question for both of you. And what exactly is a production designer? And <laughs> Christy, we'll start with you. So a production designer is in charge of the visual content of the entire film. Uh, it starts with locations, uh, once the location, you, first it starts with what city and state or country are you going to actually film the film in, um, or even in television as well. Once you figure that part out, so it's the look of the film, it's sets, um, it's props, it's supervision of props, it's the whatever you see on camera uh, is something that the production designer is worried about and wants to make sure it's correct. I mean, I would say the, which is kind of falls into what I'm mostly known for, which is conceptual illustration. It's defining the visual look and style of a film, whether it's realistic and contemporary or it's fantasy and completely out of this world. You're helping visually define how the film looks. Locations versus set. Why build a set? This is for you, Christy. Well, um, once you've found all the locations, and each film has many locations, like Goodfellas, which I did, had about 90 locations. Um, no, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. 90 locations. And, but here, in this, in this world, you're looking for all the locations that are demanded of you on, I'm sorry, I'm That's here. Okay. I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, you're looking for all the locations that are in the script. Now, sometimes you're going to need to build. And a couple of reasons why you want to build is, for example, if it's an elevator or a bathroom, sometimes those are too small. 
uh, to shoot in. By the time you get a camera in and lights and the actors and everything else, you're in a tiny, tiny space. And so you want to build those because you want to be able to move the walls. The other time that you can have to build a set is, for example, a film that I did uh, called Changing Lanes, where the lead actor, in this case Ben Affleck, decided to set all of the uh, sprinkler system going in the middle of a scene. So he went into a kitchen, he lit a piece of paper, he goes up, he <laughs> ignites the sprinkler system, and the entire office, every single square inch, got drenched with a sprinkler. So first of all, I'm not sure there are too many offices in the city that would allow that or would want it. And second of all, we had to shoot it more than once. So we had to start it again. We had to clean up everything. We had to swab the decks. We had to put down all new papers and all new everything. And then we'd start the scene again. And they'd go, oh, and then the water was actually warm so that the actors weren't freezing. Uh, but that's the kind of set you have to build. And then there are all different things. There are all different kinds of things like that. Or well, if it's not in this world. Or if it's, it's not, not in this, this world, world. Yeah. thank you. You know, as a concept illustrator, I do end up working on films like The Smurfs, or the Teenage Mutant, Ninja, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. So you're trying to create an alternate reality within our reality, and that ends up um, kind of... Always. You know, it's yeah. kind of, it lends itself to wanting a built set versus an actual location. Well, th there's another question for you, Javier. You are known for your chameleon-like abilities to visually and conceptualize virtually anything needed by a production uh, using both digital and traditional mediums. Can you give us an example of a recent project where you had to use both mediums? Sure. So just to give you a little sense of my pro process, I'm, as a concept illustrator, I always start with a sketch, whether it be um, a really complicated illustration at the end or not, it always helps me think if I'm starting on paper. The next step I usually end up doing is building a 3D model to some capacity, so I'm not lying through my renderings. Um, it's, it's very deceptive through conceptual illustration to not tell the truth, so you want to um, speak the truth as often as possible. Um, then I start layering and texturing uh, digitally using um, Photoshop, and I end up with a very clean illustration at the end. Now, I say chameleon because there's so many things within the art department and within a film that need drawings. So I'm also a storyboard artist. I also do prop design. I do murals within movies, um, books, pieces of art that need to be specific for a scene, a character, or a location. So that's where like the chame chameleon mixed media all comes in because we live in 2019 and at some point it's all going digital. For example, if we were in a film where we were going to destroy a painting, we might have to paint it and then digitally print it so we have multiple copies of that painting. And that's really where the mix comes in, where you would paint something traditionally, oil on canvas, acrylic on canvas, then you'd either photograph it or scan it, and then you'd get it printed so it can be used as a prop. Uh, the last time I had to do that for a piece of, uh, for a prop itself was for um, God Friended Me, which I believe is a TV show on some network at the moment and they had to do uh, a book that was supposed to have been made by one of the characters within the story. But again, it was going to be destroyed or ripped and they needed to make multiple copies. So these original watercolors that I did were scanned and then reprinted digitally so that we had um, multiple copies of the same book. And wow. I, I actually mm -hmm. recently just worked with Javi um, yeah. on, uh, there's a series out now called New Amsterdam on NBC. And um, in the episode that I actually directed, which is on next Tuesday night, <laughs> 10 p.m. on NBC, um, <laughs> might as well get that in there. <laughs> yeah. You should, you um, should. It's very exciting. Yeah, that's, a, that's also something that happened to me recently. I've, I've been directing quite a lot of things. So not quite a lot, four. Um, but Javi, we needed a mural and you'll see this on the show, um, a character has to paint a huge mural on a wall in a hallway in our hospital. And so we wanted to try and figure out what that mural was going to be. But we also had problems because we were going to have to put it up very fast. So what happened was, first we had to decide what it was. And it's a, a, a beautiful tree of life. 
Javi did the original artwork until we got it the way we needed it. He would make certain modifications, and that's great because he can do it on computer. It's real fast. Then, after it was all approved by everybody, we had it digitally reproduced on uh, a big, actually, what was it? It was sort of a big, um, it's like contact paper. Mm -hmm. It's a sticky back a vinyl. A sticky back vinyl. So the whole thing was put then on the wall, and we had to do that overnight. So, which would normally take maybe a week to paint. Javi generated it all on computer. We put it up on the wall. Mm -hmm. Then scenic artists came in and kind of painted over it so that it didn't look oh. like it was going to be like a, you know, a, sh a, a shower curtain or something and too shiny. So then we painted over it, and there it was. So it, it, the, mixed, uh, the mixed media of it all, it, it, it comes from a lot of different places. But, and Javi's so talented in so many different ways that he generated the actual artwork and then we put it up, and then it became part of our set. We've come a long way from just storyboards. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and those we, are digital now, too. That's right, digital storyboards. Digital storyboards. Yeah. Um, we have some um, virtual questions coming in from other film schools, but I have one more question for both of you before we take those questions. And what is the hardest part, and what is the most rewarding part of your job? And we'll start with Christy. Okay, so the hardest part of my job I guess the hardest part of my job is figuring out what we're going to do. Um, there's so many things that have to be taken into consideration, um, not the least of which is money and how much is something's going to cost to do, uh, what's going to be right for the story, um, sitting down with the director and conceiving of and collaborating with the director and the director of photography on what it is that we actually need to to actually create. Um, it's also the most exciting part because the world is out there for us to use as, as inspiration for what it is that we're going to be filming. And that's what the production designer is doing, is taking ideas from out in the world and funneling them through and onto a, a different medium, in this case, either television or film. So, that's, that's, that's sort of the hardest part. And also getting it done in time, because everybody's got schedules, and the least of which movies have big schedules. TV's even harder. Yeah. Um, so it's getting, it's getting that onto, uh, into, into a physical reality, and then getting it on board so that everyone can see it. Javi? I think I, I'll piggyback by saying I think the hardest thing is timing and how with so much content being produced at the moment, things are just going faster and faster and faster. And it's just like, that's, that's definitely the hardest component to it all. Nothing is ever, you have a week to do this. It's usually, it's, we need it in two days. Overnight. Overnight. <laughs> so the speed Sometimes. of which we have to work is very, it's very draining because you can't even take a moment to be like, oh my God, I have a great job. This is awesome. <laughs> it's like, oh, this is due in a few hours. I got to go. So that's, I think that's sort of part. And the most rewarding part for me is always, you know, getting a phone call from a relative who's like, I saw your name on this thing. Oh, yeah. And sharing it with them and being able to um, I share the art form and then have a conversation about whatever it is about um, yeah. and related to the film, TV, or whatnot. Yeah. That, that's great. Um, we're going to take some questions now from other film schools. And Claude, introduce yourself. Tell the audience who you are. And we're going to get a camera on you in a moment. And then we'll take the first question. Please make sure we know what school it's coming from. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Claude McCammon. I'm an MEDP student, first year student. Um, pleasure to meet you guys. Uh, the first question comes from Nancy at Fordham University. And it's for both of you. Uh, how did each of you get your first job? Now, I'll start with Christy. Yep. How did you get your first job? OK, my first job, uh, my first job in this business, we'll say, was uh, when Alan Parker, who directed Fame, um, hired me because I had worked, I had gone to the High School of Music and Art. And Fame was about the High School of Music and Art and the High School of Performing Arts. And so when I met him, he, it, it was sort of a combination of the fact that I had gone to Music and Art and also that I had been doing costume design briefly before that time. So it was a, it was a big break for me. So that's how I 
that was my first job. Oh, yeah. uh, I could explain it a little bit up top, but I just uh, got a connection through the Maryland Film Commission. I made the phone call, I presented my work, and then just let that speak for itself, and then waited patiently until I got a phone call and said you got the job. So it was much more traditional. And that's actually a good point. I think, just to piggyback on that for a second, in terms of how you get into this business, which I think is a lot of people want to know, uh, there are a lot of different ways you can. One is to call the New York State Film Commission or any film commission in any city or any state in the United States and say, you know, you want to get on a film and how can you do that? Mm -hmm. And one of the best ways to get on board, if you're talented like Javi and you have you know, a, a, an actual uh, portfolio that you can show people, that's one thing. Or you can come on board as a PA, which is a production assistant. And what's great about that is you really see all aspects of filming, and then you can gradually decide which, which kind of job you want to learn how to do. And then once you've got that um, information, then next time you can you know, get on the next crew. Because once you start on a crew, it's a great way. Be, somehow or other, people just keep calling you. Yep. So it's, yeah. And if you can present yourself well and you work hard, I think it's, it's people want to work with hard working, good people. So if that's whom you are, they're, they're going to they're gonna scoop you up and, and take them with you from, from job to job, job and to then job, yeah. encourage you to grow because that's it's a very encouraging environment once you're in it. Yeah. We have a second question, Claude. Um, tell yes. us what school it's coming in from. This question is from Lewis at Ithaca College, and it's for Christy. Uh -huh. um, you were nominated for two Academy Awards for uh, Art Direction for, for Revolutionary Road, directed by Sam Mendes, and as, as Good As It Gets, directed by James Brooks. Did the Oscar nomination change your career in some way, the films and the TV shows you were uh, asked to work on? And did your salary increase with the Oscar nomination? <laughs> I wish. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, it certainly gives you a tremendous amount of uh, notoriety in a very short period of time because everybody, you know, when you get nominated for an Oscar, that's a big deal. And in the case of Revolutionary Road, that was a period film. Uh, and so everybody who worked on that film with me also feels great because it's not just me who gets the, uh, no, you know, the recognition, but it's everybody in my department. Because the art department is not just me. The art department is me, an art director, set decorator, props, construction, paint. Sometimes there are 50, 60, 70 people in the art department alone, depending on how big the, the, the show is. So doing that is a, is a great recognition to, for everybody. Anyway, then um, as good as it gets, I was on uh, as a producer. Now that's a bigger deal because that's the whole film. And that was a very, very wonderful, again, recognition for what I had done. Sadly, it doesn't always uh, it doesn't always show in terms of your salary, because your salary can be either fixed because of the unions of it all, but you can also, if you want to, you can ask for more money, and if you're lucky, you'll get it. <laughs> Great segue into your. Yeah, well, let's take one more question. Tell us which school. It's uh, coming this in from. third question comes from Charles. He's at Brooklyn College, and it's for both of you. When you, what union do you belong to, and how important is it to belong to a union? So, union question. We'll start with Javi. Yeah, uh, so Javi. Uh, we're both a part of uh, United Scenic Artists Local 829, which covers jurisdiction, I think, on all of the Northeast. Um, but they really protect us in terms of salary, health care, pension, that kind of stuff gives a structure. They don't actually get you the work, but once you do get the work, they say you can't be hired at less or below this rate which especially for me being a young kid growing up in the industry, it really helped give me quite a strong platform to, to leap into. Christy, the importance of the union for you? Yeah, yeah I think it's, it's a very good thing, but um, you, you can, it doesn't mean that you can't work if you're not in a union. Mm -hmm. uh, the film industry, actually now more than ever, New York is the busiest it's ever been, thanks to the tax incentives that the state offers for production here. Um, and it legitimately, the unions protect you so that you're not working 
long hours, you're not, um, you know, and you get health and pension benefits, which is really great, really important. Um, if you start in this business, you may not be a member of the union. Once you become more recognized and if you're a designer of any kind, it's important to be in the, in, uh, in the union because number one, it raises the standard of excellence that, you know, so anyone who's hiring somebody and you're part of Local 829, it's because you have passed a certain criteria of expertise, whether you've taken the test or if you come in as a professional entry. So the union gives you protection and it gives you health and, and, and uh, pension benefits. Um, you can work without it because there's a lot going on here. There's commercials, there, there's smaller productions, non-union, they don't have enough money, they can't do it. Students, you know, make films all the time. You don't have to be a member of a union to work there. Uh, if you can get in, it's a good idea. We're gonna take more questions, but now I have a question for both of you um, about a more recent film. Uh, in Alfonso Curion's film, Roma, the intricate details of the interior are flush with most of the director's childhood furniture, a mass from his relatives. Uh, streets and sideways had to be paved and recreated in order to sustain the feel of the worn 1970s Mexico City. Budget, budget, budget. Creatively, how does the budget interact with your work? We'll start with Christy. Well, if you don't have the money, good luck. <laughs> It's important, though, if there is a budget, and there is a budget for everything, uh, it's important to acknowledge it, and it's important to try and figure out how you can do your work with the money that they give you to spend. That's where Javi comes in, mm -hmm. big time, because what he can do with his concept illustrations is for me, for example, when I work with Javi, is to show the producers uh, what we are intending to do. And by showing them a really good photorealistic rendering of a set or a street scene, and that was period, so in Roma, that was back in, that 70s. was in the 70s, so nothing looks like that now in Mexico City. So in order for them to figure out how much they needed to spend to get that world to look like it did, um, the set decorator is gonna be looking for period elements, the locations, uh, department is going to look for, for streets that can easily be turned into 1970s. Um, and of course the production designers over all of that. And what Javi brings to the table in that case is giving us these fantastic renderings that say this is how it's going to look. Then we can put a number to it. And if it's too much, a couple of things can happen. Either we have to pale back, pair, pair back or in this case, his furniture came from his house, you know, and his family. So he brought the furniture and put it on, on the set. And he did that for a couple reasons. He did that because thematically, uh, this was about his life and his, and his youth. And so, hey, if, it's in, if you can get ha a hold of it and it's free, why not? You know, it's a couple, couple of reasons. Um, sometimes you have to do computer generated imaging in the background, CGI. And that's when you ha have a big wide scene and you can look all the way down the street, but right at the end, there's like a modern building that you don't want to see in, our s in the story. And in post-production, they can get rid of that. We did a film together called Tower Heist, which was this preposterous film. I don't know if any of you saw it. Uh, it was a, a heist uh, at in the Trump International Building in, the, in Columbus Circle. And they had uh, this ridiculous thing of a car that was hung out the, the building and dropped down and put into another apartment. And it turned out that the car was, anyway. So all of this was done in CGI. Javi did a lot of the provision, uh, they call them previs, which is he'll do a still of the scene exactly how we want it to look. And so he would do the picture of the outside of the building with this red car hanging there and the, and the, and the parade of Thanksgiving Day parade on the, on the ground. And they were able to take that and then turn it into a previs, which was the, the thing that, but that's all money. That's money spent in post as opposed 
to money spent in pre-production. You want to add anything to that? No, uh, I think Chrissy <laughs> summed it up yeah. quite nicely. Yeah. <laughs> so the, actually, the next question is for you. Um, what is the biggest difference between designing for the for film and theater? Um, so I, I do work in, I have worked in the past five years a lot in theater. Um, I was very fortunate to be brought on to Hamilton when it went into the public, so I helped conceptualize that show. Nice. Um, but the biggest thing for theater is TV and film, you're watching, um, you're looking at scenery from very up close. You're gonna be very intimate with these sets and these props and these, and these worlds. But in theater, it's all from 30 feet plus, and there's some people who are seeing it from hundreds of feet, not hundreds, but quite a couple, a couple of rows back. And so you're, the, 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 con, the way of thinking about scenery, the way of stylizing the scenery, it's just a, a whole different way because you want those details to read a mile back. So if I was to do, I just worked on Beetlejuice, which is opening up in like two weeks. They, um, the whole set looks drawn. If you go up to the set and look at it, the lines look massive. And we have to do that because if not, it wouldn't read like a drawing from the balcony or the mezzanine. I think that's the biggest difference. It's the this, this, this sense of scale and the intense exaggeration you have to apply to the scenic painting of your sets on the stage so that it reads from the distance. Because in a film, the camera can really get in there and you can, right. you can really see the detail versus right. needing to see it from, from the right. distance. I think that's the biggest difference. Chrissy, um the next question, um, I know you elaborated a little on this, but if you just talk a little more about period versus modern day, um, the difficulties working as a production designer in New York City. Well, you can tell that the, the, everywhere you look now in New York City, there's construction. Every single street, practically, in all the boroughs has construction on it. So. That means two things. It means what used to be there isn't there anymore. And what they're building is probably not something you want to see if it's a period film. Um, so it's tough. It's very tough because a lot of what you used to be able to use as an early v version of Manhattan or Bronx or Queens or Brooklyn h hardly holds up unless it's a historical neighborhood because everybody wants to build condos now or whatever they're doing. Um, I did a film called Sleepers um, with Barry Levinson, the director, and we were sh supposed to shoot all of that. The, the story took place in Hell's Kitchen in uh, Manhattan, which is over on the west side, sort of in the 50s, 40s and 50s. Um, well, Manhattan over the, in that area is like nothing is there anymore practically that used to be. Uh, in addition, it's a very expensive area to shoot in because you have to close everything down. You have to change every, every storefront, every, every street, you know, even the, uh, you know, there's no pay, tele you know, for, y for your cars, you know. All these things have to go. And it's, if it's on ground level, it's tough. You can still do it with a lot of CGI, but it, so anyway, I wound up going out to, um, Greenpoint, the Greenpoint section of Brooklyn, over there by Metropolitan Avenue and that whole area. And we turned that into Ninth Avenue. We literally made that look like That's Hell's cool. Kitchen because all of the buildings that were there hadn't been changed. Um, there w we created all our own storefronts. We turned it into a back lot. Now going over there now, it's already changed. Mm -hmm. It's already changed so much that it would be really hard to do that movie there. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people go to other cities to make it look like New York. Uh, sometimes they go up to Troy or Albany because there are sections of that set city that are all that, that, are, that, that are the same. But it's a big challenge, you know, the cars, nothing can be the same as what you use in, in current day. And so you have to make it a nice small section of a city and then you have to just completely change it. So it's tough. A city in transition every day. Yeah. Um, this is for both of you. Um, what is a typical schedule for working on a feature film versus a TV show? Wh where, do you, where do you see you don't really have enough time to do what you really want to do? We'll start with Javi. Um, so when I'm only concept doing conceptual illustration, it's, it's kind of boring. I go to the office at 8. I sit at the desk. I'm drawing, drawing, drawing all day. I might have a meeting thrown in there, but I take a break at lunch maybe two smaller breaks, but I'm sitting drawing all day until like 6.30 in the evening. 
So it's a, it's a very intense process because they're demanding a lot out of you um, and there's not a lot of change. Um, I've done, when you're production designing or art directing, it's a lot more exciting, there's a lot more movement to it. Um, but it's kind of starting your mornings with construction crews and scenic crews, getting them going, then going to the art department and getting your art department team working, drafting, doing what they need to do, then meeting with your director, meeting with your producers, having some sort of production meetings. You, it's, it really moves all day, all day. So do you, have, do you have people looking over your shoulder? Are there producers and writers and production team watching over your shoulder while you're drawing? No, I think this is a, oh, no, no. The only person who might watch over my shoulder is a director now and again and the production designer, who I'm there to support yeah, as I've, a concept I've, illustrator. I've stood next to you on occasion. For many hours, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's fun because you know, one of the beautiful things about what we do is this is a very collaborative effort. Yeah. We're all here to help each other out. I'm here to support Christy, Christy's here to support me. So there's something, there's a community aspect to building something when you're working in yeah. the art department. I mean, have you ever had Martin Scorsese that's tapped you on the shoulder and say, it looks great? No, no. I did have, um, um, when we did Wall Street too. Um, Oliver, Stone. Oliver, Oliver Stone. Stone. He came yeah, over. He to just you? like like would hover because of where my desk was, and he would just stand there and like look. And like five minutes in, I'm like, oh boy. But he <laughs> he'd say anything. Just look. No, he didn't say much. He would yeah. say something to make a comment. Because really, he's Christie's his the production designer is really his collaborator there. Okay. He, sometimes. And, and Christy, how about you? Um, well, actually, your schedule on that. Well, just to make a little comment about Oliver Stone um, in uh, Wall Street Two. There's a scene where, um, uh, oh my God, what's his name? The, the, the guy, ah, anyway, yeah. <laughs> this is terrible, I can't remember anything. <laughs> anyway, um, he shows up in this apartment that he's gonna stay in since he got out of jail, Michael Douglas. Um, and we had done this incredible, beautiful apartment and it, it, it was really period. It was supposed to look like no one had really been in it in a while because he came out like, like 20 years after he got put into, the, into jail. Um, and anyway, so I had gotten Javi to do some really, I think you did those, didn't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Beautiful rend renderings of what this apartment was going to look like. And he loved it and everything was great. And he walked in on the day and he stood around and he said, what is this place? <laughs> 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 and I said, it's the apartment that you approved, Oliver, <laughs> because we had had the picture. A, your drawings were better than the yes. apartment. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> it was true. That's great. Uh, Javi's That's great. drawings are actually better than, than it looked in person. I Thank think you. our film students would like to hire you. They want to know your per diem rate. Oh. You're doing their thesis <laughs> film. Um, we have a, a, a couple of questions from the studio audience, so Go <laughs> we're going to take those questions. So who has the first question? Um, Please say your name and nice and loud with your question. Okay. Tell us what school uh, you're from. Okay. My name is Ipatia. Um, from I'm from Community College. This question is for both of you guys. Okay. How much prep time do you usually have to design a film? And is, is the time different in both feature fi films and TV production? Okay, who wants to take that first? Uh -oh. Prep time. Yeah. Prep time. Okay. Um, I think it used to be about, on average, six weeks for a film. It seemed pretty average. You would come the on six weeks before? Six weeks before, yeah. So, but Is that, that a union thing? No, no, no. It's mm. kind of like that was the general average. Okay. I mean, sometimes if you got lucky eight, and if you had like a big um, conceptually heavy film, if it was like, Black I don't Panther? know, Smurfs, probably Black Panther, then you're talking. Oh, that's longer. Even. That's like months. Yeah. Wow. Months. Um, that's months. in development. But from the time you're like, we're going to start shooting this thing to the moment we start filming, I would say a long time is 12 weeks and quick is four to five. And Chrissy? Yeah, I think TV is faster than film normally, except actually, you know, low budget film, it can be, it, it depends on if, again, it depends on if it's modern day or yeah. fantasy or period uh, and how much time you need to actually do the preparation for it. Um, I would say, like what Javi was saying, normally a, a, a normal sort of mid-budget mid film is probably eight to 10 weeks. What's, how much is a mid-budget film? Could you tell our film students in terms of budget? Mid-budget at this point in our world is about 25, 30 million dollars. Okay, a little more than your student films. We have another question from the studio audience. <laughs> Raise your hand, tell us your name. 
Please tell us your name first and what school you're from. My name is Elizabeth Ogunloe, and I'm from Bronx Community College. And this question is for Javier. Um, what computer programs do you use to create your renderings? So I usually start with SketchUp and then uh, take a screenshot of a, a viewer and angle that I like and then work primarily in Photoshop. I use uh, a Wacom tablet that allows me to draw um, and make it feel more like I'm painting or drawing on, on paper digitally. And I actually also have been playing a lot with the, um, the Apple Pencil on the iPad, and that's actually been quite fun. There's a lot of new programs that make it feel like you're actually painting so digitally. What are the new programs on App Apple, the iPad? I mean, I, I, I couldn't even tell you. Yeah, okay. But how <laughs> yeah, is it SketchUp, is that an expensive program? Well, SketchUp, I actually don't know. For na I, I have SketchUp Pro, so you pay for it, but there is, I believe there is a free version of it. Okay. Uh, they might, the students might know better than I. Okay. But Something that it's very do. easy to use. It's about making shapes and pushing and pulling. And for me, what I'm really trying to get a sense of is making sure that what I'm drawing is in some sort of scale. So I can tell my designer or my team, this is three feet high, this line, I'm thinking the ceiling is here, this element that I've drawn is four feet wide or whatever it needs to be. But I want to I wanna create some sort of realistic paradigm so that I'm not, so that not, we're not working in a void, which is a rendering. We have a third question. Um, please uh, let, let us know your name and what school you're from. Who has another question? John, John please. Okay, my name is um, John Tompkins from Bronx Community College. Um, this question is for the both of you. Do you have any tips or recommendations for young filmmakers starting out who want to enter the world of production design? Okay, good question. Um, Christy first, and then yeah. What do you think? Oh no, no. Uh, oh, <laughs> that's our. I'm here. That's our live I, studio crew. I apologize. Yeah, I'm okay. like, I don't know. If I'm just <laughs> you're the you're the live show at Bronx Community. A lot of live things happening out here. Um, any suggestions of if someone like John if he wants to become a production, production designer? designer? Okay. Well, where should he have his internship? Yeah. So. I think the most important thing is to see if you can get on a, either a TV or a film uh, set here in New York as a PA. A PA is a production assistant. And if you can get on a production uh, that, has, that needs production assistance, that's the lowest sort of entry level job. And everybody, every single person should start that way. Even if you move up, and you will, um, if you come in as a PA, then you can work and you, you, know, you may do very, very menial tasks at first, like ordering lunch and helping to make copies of, of you know, uh, sets, drawings, things like that that we're doing. Um, but the, the idea is that you want to begin there. Now, how you find those jobs is where you can call like the New York Film Commission and say, I'm interested in coming on board as an entry level person. Um, where and how can I s submit my resume? And that'll get you at least to the first, first step, which is to put yourself on a list. I wish there was something more complete in the Film Commission's office. Yeah, there's a, a PA there? program in the New York City Mayor's Office for Film and TV. There you One go. of the things I want to mention to our Bronx audience, um, just to give you an example, in the day I called the Bronx Council on the Arts, told them I was a film student at NYU, and they kept my number, they called me back, and they said, uh, we got a call from the, this new Richard Price movie called The Wanderers, they need alleyways, and you're a filmmaker, do you want to work? for $50 a day on the location team, call the Bronx Council on the Arts. Tell them I told you to call them. Let them know you're looking yeah, for Yeah, locations is a great way to get in, too, even for if it's for art department. Because, again, you're out there looking. You're, you're walking around the streets of New York with a camera, and you're looking to try and find the locations that we need for film. That's fantastic experience. Huh? Yeah. It's hard. But it's very hard. And I'll moment. tell you, 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 this is actually something really important to say. Um, this, these are not easy jobs. They are, you know, you, it's like, it seems very glamorous and it seems kind of wonderful. But as you start, even like costumes, for example, like you might get on, on board a film in the costume department 
And all you're going to do for the first however many days is sort shoes. You know, people who, it's like a period film or it's a doctor's film or a hospital and all they have is racks upon racks of scrubs and all these things. They all have to be sized. They have to be, you know, put into or organizations of like hanging them in different places. All of that can, starts out and it seems really boring and kind of scary or, or whatever. Uh, but that's how you get started. We have one more question. Raise your hand. You have one more question. Yes, Claude, you have one? Um, this question is from Christopher at Brooklyn College, and it's for Javier. You're a member of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Science in your field. How did you get nominated for the, um, to be an Academy member, and can you vote for yourself <laughs> if you receive an Oscar nomination? <laughs> Um, okay, I think you Christy might be able to clarify this too, because she's a, you're a member as well, right? Yeah, yeah. So I you're think you can for vote for yourself. Right? Yeah, I did. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure it's very exciting. I have yeah. not had that that opportunity yet, uh, but very fortunately, there, so there's a nomination process from within uh, the academy that you can nominate uh, members or people who are not members yet to become members that aren't necessarily going to be nominated for a film, but they're people like me who are more concept illustrators or um, set painters or just craftspeople, and they um, have some sort of review process, and you have to be nominated. It's kind of like a secret ballot you don't really know, and then one day you start getting random emails that are, congratulations, congratulations, like, what, did, what did I do? And then that I, was my I process. I think you get three people to nominate you. Well, first of all, if you get nominated, you're in. If, if you just happen oh, to right. be lucky enough to be nominated for a film and you're not a member of the Academy, after you've been nominated, you're automatically... You're talking about nominated for the, an actual award. Yes, yeah. yes, right. Okay. But if you want to join the Academy, uh, you need to get three people who are in the field that you want to be in. In other words, in my case, I wanted to get in as a production designer. So I asked other production designers who are in the Academy to write a letter of recommendation. And then they look at what you've done, and they see who's recommending you and usually it's uh, you know hopefully you've got enough credits and it's I think it's like 200 or 300 dollars a year and you're in so the question is now do you guys get like a half bag of those swag items that they give out at the Oscars I mean <laughs> what kind of perks do you get? well he no. just worked on the Oscars that's right you I were did. the Oscar I worked with the creative team to design the scenery for the okay. Oscars this year. There was no swag bags No bag swag for bags crew. for you. It was a nice jacket. <laughs> a nice jacket. Okay, very cool. It had the uh, Oscar on it? It had the Oscar logo, very cool. yeah. Very cool. Cool, nice. man. That's cool. So we're going to hold off on questions for a moment. I have another question for both of you. Um, what is your favorite film that you worked on and your favorite film experience? And we'll start with Javier. I'll start with my favorite film experience. Um, uh, I... I think more because of the amount of growth I experienced within it was working on a film called Extremely Loud and Incredibly Close, Great which was nominated for an Oscar that year. Awesome. And for me, the reason why I loved it is I got hired to be within the art department, but then found ways to be useful to every, almost every single department. So I was called one day to help the director storyboard because the storyboard artist that was actually hired got s called out sick and then ended up, they ended up like using two storyboard artists, and I was on board for that as well. I ended up working with the props department to not only design props from a conceptual space, but also physically build them. So it was just one of those experiences where I was supposed to be working for three to six weeks and ended up being on the job for nine months. And, just, <laughs> and then I got and then helped them great great art direct. They had to do reshoots and they rebuild one of the sets, so oh, I helped them. Great. So we that, that, that um, answering machine that Tom Hanks leaves the message on, did you, did you help find that? I did that? not help find it. That <laughs> okay. is for the set dresser. I leave set that dresser. to them. Okay. All these she different was a departments. Pro. Or he was a pro, I think it was. Christy, what's your ex favorite experience? <sighs> favorite, uh, well, I'm sure you have many. I, I've been very lucky in my, in my career to have worked with uh, some astonishing directors. Um, and... I think probably my best experience was with, I, I've done several, or did several of Jonathan Demme's movies. Um, unfortunately, Jonathan is no longer with us. Um, but I would say it was a combination of Married to the Mob, working on a Jonathan Demme movie is not like working on any other film. First of all, he's so collaborative. He, 
he'll take ideas from anybody. Really? And production uh, assistants also? Everybody. Huh. Everybody. Um, and actually, in this case, I, I, they were all such incredible experiences. But Married to the Mob, we were in, in Florida. We were um, all over the place. Uh, Silence of the Lambs was insane, uh, but a, an incredible experience. Um, Oscars for everybody. Oscars for everybody. Not me, <laughs> <laughs> but that's okay. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and then he did, uh, he did Philadelphia, he did Beloved. Uh, these are all films I worked on with him. Great and film. My classmate Ron Nyswander at Columbia wrote Ron, the screenplay for right, that. Right, Ron. Film. Ron, who's a dear friend of mine. Great, okay. Um, so I, I would say that all of my Jonathan Demme films are my best experience. Okay. This is for you, Christy. Um, the next question. Um, the director, James Cameron, once said, quote, I actually started as a model builder oh. and quickly progressed into production design, which made sense because I could draw and paint. But I kept watching that guy over there who was moving the actors around and <laughs> setting up the shots, unquote. Do you feel sometimes like James Cameron on the set? And can you talk, I know you talked a little about it, but a little bit more about your directing assignment on the NBC TV show New Amsterdam that's coming up next week? <laughs> I already set it to record. <laughs> 10 o'clock channel for NBC, correct? Yes. 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 Um, yeah, I mean, I was obviously, and again, this is Jonathan Demme. So I would show him locations, and he would say, how, how do you want to use this? Why do, why do you want us to shoot here? Now, not every director does that, but Jonathan did. So I had to really come up with the reasons, not just because of the visuals of why I wanted to shoot there, but in terms of blocking, in terms of the actors moving around in the sets and how would be, what would be the best way to shoot them inside of the things I was proposing as sets. So I had a great sort of leg up in that regard, uh, unlike maybe some of James Cameron's experiences, sure. uh, because I was really involved with you know, anyway, so I, Jonathan gave me my first job as a, as a director. Uh, he was supposed to do a half hour thing for HBO in 1990, and he didn't want to do it, and he gave it to me, and he was the producer on it. So that was my first experience. That was a narrative piece called uh, Women and Men 2, and it was with Ray Liotta and Andy McDowell. And I think the thing that I loved about doing that and also doing the one uh, recently on New Amsterdam is that I get to work with actors I get to decide what we're going to see and how we're going to see it. Um, and, and just working overall with this group of people, all of whom are working incredibly hard uh, to get the, the work done in a day. You know, we were shooting six or seven pages a day, wow. which is a lot compared to something like As Good As It Gets, where if we got two pages a day, we were lucky. Uh, so that changes everything when you realize, again, how compressed it can be. Um, but I had, an inc I, I had to do my homework. I had to know exactly what shots I needed. I had to figure out the blocking, all of that w in advance so that on the day I was up there with the DP and we were working together hand in hand to try and figure out how we were going to finish it all. And that, it's very satisfying. And you've worked with my classmate from NYU, Michael Slovis, who's been here several times to speak. Well, Michael yeah. Slovis was my mentor no, on this great. job. He exactly. gave me so much good advice, and he sat with me, and I did my shot list, and I talked to him about what I wanted to cover and how, and he said, yes, or maybe you want to try and think of that, you know? I mean, he was extremely helpful, and everybody knew that I had done my homework, and everybody also knew that I had talked to Slovis about it first, <laughs> so I had, a, I had a decent backup. <laughs> that's, that's great, yeah. great, great yeah. experience. Yeah. So this is for you, Javier. You worked on The Greatest Showman, starring Hugh Jackman, which was shot on the campus of Bronx Community College. Um, what does a concept artist do on that particular show? Or what way did you work on it? And, and what was your assignment in particular? Yeah, so I was hired uh, not within the art department for that film. I was actually hired to help the costume design, the costume department with, to help them conceptualize the wardrobes um, for, the, for the film, especially when it focused in on all of the circus um, acts and all the people involved in the circus, and that was, 
that was that was my role, and that's what I did. But it's the same process. You start with a sketch, and then bring in color digitally, and you work with uh, a, a team of people who know fabric and how to stitch and make things better than you, and you create an image that sells uh, the concept of this wardrobe to, to the director and the team above. So can you both discuss briefly uh, fantasy versus reality in your work? And we'll start with Christy. <laughs> oh, boy. Um, <laughs> You know, I think the movie that you all saw, if you did see, called Black Nativity, uh, is a really good example of the fantasy aspect of what can happen. And this was a, a film that Cassie Lemon, Casey Lemons uh, directed, and it took place in Harlem, and it was supposed to be, uh, it's, it's, it was basically the, the story of the nativity and it was a Christmas story. Um, and what happens in it is that the story is that this young boy is going up and staying with his grandparents who he doesn't know um, because his mom has lost her job and is also probably going to lose her home. And so she wanted to make sure that her son was taken care of properly and so he goes up and stays uh, with his grandparents who are you know, very conservative, well, you know, well regarded, he's a minister of a church. But in the story, uh, no, that I'm was sorry. Just a playback. <laughs> I'm sorry. So, I get so we're, we're, still, we're still live. We're so live. you hear a lot of live things <laughs> going on. Um, um, anyway, so he and has. And by the way, you both worked on that film that's together. Right, that's correct? right. Yep. That's yeah. right. So he has a dream. And in the dream, it's, it becomes this kind of very bizarre thing where in the middle of Times Square is the Bethlehem. So in the middle of Times Square, we suddenly are bringing in camels and sheep and people walking around wearing, you know, uh, biblical outfits and, and uh, everybody is sort of, and, and anyway, so then there's this other part which is later on where the, the crash where baby Jesus is born was outside of this church in, in the middle of Harlem. And so we had a, a bazaar, uh, you know, with uh, people selling how their goods. And in the back was like this a flea market, a flea yeah. market kind of thing. Only it was all done as if it were back in the day of Jesus. <laughs> so we had to blend in old things, new things, and make it into this, this different world, mm -hmm. which is lots of fun. But of course, then there are things like Black Panther and and other Marvel films, which, you know, talk about fantasy. Yeah. You, have you, you've you, done some of those. You've worked right? on some of those I've worked films. on some of them. I think for me, when you do conceptual work for, let's say, New Amsterdam, it's a lot about editing mm -hmm. and helping sell something that's very contemporary in a new way or, or uh, kind of editing down the colors so it feels a certain way. But with fantasy, especially as a concept illustrator, you, can, you have a lot of influence because they're, the production team is searching um, through you to find what that world actually looks like because there's nothing like it. Like Black Panther, you know, it's, and it's not just conceptualizing for scenery but also costume. I mean, those two Everything. together Everything. really creates a whole new world. And, and as a, for me, fantasy is always, it's just a heightened sense of fun because you really can pull from anywhere. And you're always trying to, whether it's contemporary or not, you're always trying to make something new. But there's something about fantasy that's like, we know what, Every period kind of has, or every decade kind of has a look to it in terms of the fantasy films it makes. So I'm, I'm kind of, I'd like to believe I'm contributing to what this decade is. Man, this sounds so much <laughs> like Kathy Lee Gifford, our last show last week. She goes, uh, my dad told me, find something, find something that you're good at and then find someone who will pay you for it. Yeah. And you guys are doing what you like. And we're I think lucky. that's great. So we're going to take one more question from another. Is it another film school coming in? Yes, sir. Okay, so please tell us uh, the film school, Claude, and where it's coming from. All right, this question is from Pedro at Hostess um, Community College, and it's for the both of you. Uh, you both worked in different production roles uh, on Black Nativity, uh, directed by Cassie Lemons. Do you each recommend each other to the producers or who hire you, or is it just coincidence that the two of you worked on the projects together? So, Christy, you want to start first? And well, um, uh, I think <laughs> in this case, uh, we were going to, there was actually supposed to be one more person here, 
um, Doug Husty, who is our art director. And we, we decided to make uh, Black Nativity our film to discuss because all mm. three of us worked on it together. Um, oftentimes, we try and work together to, because we have a history of working together as production design, art director, concept illustrator, as a team. Because uh, once you start to find people that you like to work with who are good at what they do, you want to keep having them back again and again and again. And so in my, inst in my experience, I like to have uh, people who I like, like to be around and who are also very talented. So that's why the coincidence was that we deliberately wanted to have uh, a film that we had all worked on together to discuss. But the production designer tends to hire the concept illustrator. Yes. No, okay. It yes. That's mm -hmm. usually the case. Isn't the, like it? other wild card would be that the director wants to work with the concept illustrator and then yeah. they bring that person on. Yeah. Okay. And then you can find yourself working on the same project but not necessarily. Okay. Networking, department. networking. Worked out. Networking. No, networking. Yeah. We have one more question from our studio audience. Please say your name, what school you're from, what department you're in. Um, yes, right up here. Um, my name is Glenn Santana. I'm, I'm sorry, one more time, Glenn, a little louder. My name is Glenn Santana. I'm in I go to Bronx Community College. I'm an MDP student. And this is a question for both of you. I know Javier brought it up a little bit. You went to Baltimore? Uh, yep, yeah, Maryland school? Institute College of Art. Yeah. So what school did you both go to, and what did you study to prepare you for the work you're doing right now? Okay, who wants to start? I'll, I'll Javier, go first. Start so first. I went to the Maryland Institute College of Art, and I studied illustration. But what I'll tell you prepared me the most for what I'm doing now was the work ethic that the school gave me in conjunction with just the, the constant drawing and practicing of my skill set and just doing it over and over and over again. And it met, even if it's just the same thing, let's say you like figure drawing, you know, that today um, is very useful now that I'm doing storyboard, storyboards for directors. So just, just the fact that I did it a lot. Um, Christy? Well, you're going to laugh, but I went to, Colum well, I first I went to Middlebury for a year, and then I, went, I came back to New York and went to Columbia University School of General Studies. Um, I thought I was going to be a journalist, and that's what I went to school for. And I was going to go to journalism school, and I was going to be a journalist. And then <laughs> um, after I'd been there for a couple of years, I got hired as a stylist for a commercial photographer. And that was great because it was a freelance job. I'd get paid a daily rate. I'd do uh, the job for like a week or two, and then I would do another one. And that was kind of fabulous because I, had, I was my own sort of master, if you will. Um, so even though I didn't study it, I learned on the job. And that's a very good way to learn this business, is to do it on the job. Yeah, on the job, it is the best way to learn. Um, our, our time has come to an end, and, and we'd like to thank our distinguished panelists for taking the time to talk to us today. What an insightful conversation this has been. We can do a part two of this show. <laughs> uh, I'd also like to thank the New York Governor's Office of Motion Picture and Television Development, the New York Production Alliance, the New York Film and Television Student Alliance, and our studio TV crew from the Media and Digital Film Club here at Bronx Community College. See you next time on Open Doors. <laughs> what a great show. <laughs>